The following program contains recreations of actual events. Tonight, these true stories. The San Francisco earthquake. A little girl stands paralyzed with fear. Her injured mother helpless to save her as their house is falling apart. Another mother wages a personal war on drugs. Wearing a police wire, she goes undercover into a dealer's secret lab. On a routine flight aboard a commuter airline, the pilot is inspecting the cabin when suddenly... Tonight, on Against All Odds. Lindsay Wagner and Edward McGill. Good evening. Now, at some point in our lives, every one of us faces what seems like the most impossible odds. It can happen any place, any time. Well, tonight we're going to look at three remarkable stories, examples that the worst of circumstances can bring out the best in us. Imagine you're a co-pilot on a small airliner and you've just learned that your pilot has fallen out of the plane. It was one of the most remarkable airline emergencies ever. And it began when the pilot, 45-year-old Henry Dempsey, and his co-pilot, Paul Boucher, heard a strange noise in the cabin of their plane. They were flying a twin-engine commuter plane, which normally seated 15 passengers. For this flight, it was empty. Captain Hank Dempsey went back to inspect. All right, will you keep this thing in the air, and I'll check it out. You got it. All right, you got it? door was making quite a bit of noise. It was a lot noisier than it ordinarily would be. I knew not to touch anything like that in flight. I, I stayed well clear of it. I was going to sit down in the seat next to it, strap myself in that seat. As I began to uh, turn around to sit down in that seat and to fasten the seat belt about me, we hit a little bump. And the next thing you know, I was outside the airplane. The plane was flying at 190 miles an hour, 4,000 feet above the Earth at near freezing temperatures. The 190 mile an hour winds pinned Hank to the stairs. Hank yelled for help, but the wind made it useless. Assuming Hank had fallen out of the open door, Paul radioed for permission to make an emergency landing at the Portland, Maine International Jet Port. Bob Reed, 75, what's your emergency? Captain, open the cabin door, and apparently um, I've sucked out some harm. You might want to call the Coast Guard, the position where we put the emergency, and get the Coast Guard out there. I remember that my feet were on the side of the aircraft, so I was trying to steady myself with my feet and with my hands. I remember the heat from the engine, the smell of the exhaust, and I wondered at that time if uh, that's how I was going to die. I was hoping that he would go ahead and turn the airplane toward Portland, which he, which he indeed did, and when he started to turn, I, I felt a little bit better. Uh, I realized that I was in a, obviously I had myself in a predicament, and I needed to, to not waste my strength and uh, to uh, keep myself calm in order to get myself through this particular situation. As we uh, flew over the highway, I could feel the heat coming up off the pavement. Then he began to reconfigure the airplane. He dropped the gear, he dropped uh, approach flaps, and that allowed me to move around on the door a little bit. It, it, I don't think it would have allowed me to actually climb back up in the cabin. I was pretty well pinned down with a by the slipstream, and then I, I begin to get concerned about the fact that I might hit my head on the runway. Miraculously, Hank held on for 20 horrifying minutes, but there was still one last obstacle. Landing a plane with his door open and stairs down could easily end in disaster. As the plane descended towards the runway, Dempsey's head was barely 12 inches above the concrete. So uh, I just kept my eye on the runway, and when he was 
close to the runway, I just sat up on the seat. I, I guess I kind of did a setup on the seat, pulled up on the cables and cleared my head of the runway. On the ground, paramedics and firefighters raced behind the plane. I had a good position where I could see under the plane and I noticed at first clothing on the stairs. And in my mind, that's all it was, was rags or clothing. So I figured the worst. As he did land, I noticed it was a body. And I used the term body because I, I didn't think if there was a person on there that he would be alive. After the plane touched down and made its turn, we immediately followed it up. The plane came to a stop. I immediately disembarked my truck. I, I don't see any movement. I don't know whether he's alive or what condition he's in. Uh, I believe I passed out for maybe a minute or something like that. Because the next thing I remember, that were, there were an awful lot of people around me. And I remember uh, firemen and policemen and lots of noise and confusion. And uh, He was conscious, to my surprise. I did not immediately take him off the stairs. He was, he had a death grip on the railings. He, I just eased his head back down into my lap and started talking to him. What's your name? Uh, Tell me your name. Uh, Hank? He looked like somebody who had just gone to hell and back. I mean, he, the, the, the fear was just unreal. You couldn't explain it. But through all he's been through, his first words were, you haven't seen the Portland skyline until you've seen it from the view I just saw it from. Anything's broken. Can you feel anything? And it took a couple of us to literally pry his fingers off of the cables. We, we first of all, asked him to let go. And he couldn't. And we had to actually help him pull the fingers off the, off the sidebars that he was holding on to. We got you. This it, was, it was definitely a near-death experience. And, uh, it caused me to think a little bit more about uh, how I live my life and what my uh, priorities in life are. And uh, I realize that there are a lot of things now in life that people get upset about that probably aren't worth it. You spend a lot of time getting stressed out over things that don't really count. And uh, I try not to do that anymore. Well said. Not surprisingly, Henry Dempsey suffered terrible nightmares and post-traumatic stress disorder from his ordeal. But following a year and a half of therapy, he's fully recovered and flying again. In a moment, the surprising story of a little girl who crossed paths with a menacing guard dog during the San Francisco earthquake. Remember in 1989, when San Francisco was rocked by a devastating earthquake, 6.9 on the Richter scale. The quake caused millions of dollars of damage, killing and injuring hundreds of people. I'll never forget the image of that car falling into the broken section of the Bay Bridge. It was such a frightening day for so many people, and yet a day that saw countless acts of selfless bravery. Our next story depicts an extraordinary moment that took place during the earthquake. An encounter between a little girl, her mother, and a vicious guard dog. Riona was a menacing Rottweiler, a guard dog at a home in Watsonville, California. Down the block lived Karen Cooper and her five-year-old daughter, Vivian. Vivian suffered from epilepsy and required medication to control her seizures. Honey, it's all right. It's all right. Karen had to keep Vivian away from anything that might excite her and trigger an epileptic seizure. Vivian and I would go for a walk, and um, the dogs would come out and bark, and they would scare her because they were large. Um, and she would go, Vivian would get on the other side of me uh, because Vivian was so afraid. October 17th. 
5.04 p.m. It was like somebody picked the house up and was shaking it. And the first instinct that you have is get out, get out of the house. And we had to run through the kitchen to get out. Karen had broken her ankle and couldn't move. She feared that in this crisis, Vivian would lapse into a seizure. On top of the refrigerator was a microwave oven, a very large microwave oven. Uh, I knew it was gonna come down on Vivian and I couldn't get to her and she was screaming, panicked. There's nothing I could do and I never felt so helpless in all my life to know that you couldn't get to your kid and she's just a few feet away. Karen and Vivian started to scream at their house. I couldn't hear anything with the earthquake going. Riona, she took off and she ran out her dog door around the house and she jumped our fence that we have, then run across the street and then went in their house. When I saw Riona coming in that back door, at first I thought, dear God, I've got to get something to help my baby. I didn't know what this dog was going to do. Vivian stood petrified below the teetering microwave. Just then, in the nick of time, Riona knocked Vivian against the wall and out of harm's way. First thing I could think of was, get to my child. I don't know what that dog's doing to her. Uh, obviously, Riona and Vivian were frightened together, but they had their faces pushed into each other's, and they were very, very close, hugging. And I asked Riona, I said, may I have my baby back? And Riona looked at me, and um, she moved out of the way. Come here. Come here, She saw the microwave was going to fall on me, and she zoomed to get me out of the way, and she zoomed to the corner and sat on my feet and pushed me up against the wall. She was the only one that I could depend to to save my life. She protected Vivian when I couldn't. So she, I think she knew. I think she could sense, you know, that that child needed her. While no one knows for sure why Riona came to the rescue, there are scientific studies exploring the possibilities that some dogs have a sixth sense when an epileptic is about to have a seizure. Perhaps this was the case with Riona, a seemingly vicious animal who clearly demonstrated that appearances aren't always what they seem. In a moment, a mother whose daughters are addicted to speed goes undercover to bust their dealer. Watching your loved ones succumb to the lure of drugs is an ordeal for even the toughest individuals. In our next story, a 44-year-old mother and grandmother, Pat Morrison, saw her family suffering and was determined to fight back. All right, stay open, be right back. In the summer of 1988, Patricia's two grown daughters, Tonda and Devona, were visiting a drug dealer several times a week. They'd become addicted to crank, a highly dangerous form of speed. Occasionally, they even took their children when they went to buy drugs. My granddaughter was getting elected. She looked like she hadn't had a bath for days. Her hair wouldn't be combed. She wasn't eating right. I was upset about it. Countless times, Pat had begged her daughters to get off drugs. But they wouldn't listen. In desperation, with nowhere else to turn, Pat called the police. I thought about it a long time before I did it because I knew they were going to be mad at me. I knew all their friends. I knew everybody was going to be mad at me. And I, um, like I said, I wanted them, I wanted them in jail because I wanted them to go through a drug program. 
To ensure her safety, the police arranged to secretly meet Pat in a parking lot. I thought, well, I'd take him out and show him where the lab was, and they'd go back and arrest him. That's what I thought was going to happen. It's just up here on the left. Pat took the police to a drug dealer that had eluded them for nearly six years. We've been watching for some time. So far, they had failed to infiltrate the gang. We don't have a way to get in. I think I got a way. To their surprise, Pat volunteered to go undercover. I told him I thought I could work my way in through the girls by using the excuse to go out there looking for them. And they said, well, any in little information I could give them would help. And that's how it started. Over the next few days, Pat became a regular visitor to the drug farm, gathering names, license plates, and other information to help the police. I'm looking for my daughters, Tonda and Devona. Have you seen them? I felt like if I would have gotten shot or something would have happened to me, it would have been worth it to get my two girls and my granddaughter out of it. Pat's plan was to set up a face-to-face -face meeting with Jimmy, the man who ran the entire operation. I told Tonda that I had a friend in Salem, a man that was a businessman and he was married, and that he wanted to buy a pound of crank. Great, if you, if you think he's okay. Okay, fine. We'll do it. Jim! Yeah? My mom and Pat. Hi. What can I do for you? I got a friend that wants to buy a pound of crank. A pound? Does this friend have the money? I believe it's $15,000. That's right. I can do that, but um, I don't have the chemicals right now. What do you need? So I went back and told the two police officers what he needed, and they would get it for me, and they would bring it, and I'd take it out there. Here's the first bottle. The police hoped that if Pat could gain Jimmy's trust, he would take her to the hidden lab where he made the drugs. Get the rest in a minute. They wanted the information where they could charge him with manufacturing. And the only way that they could really do that was either to have another witness or to wire me where they could get the information. Here's your off and on switch. Just make sure that's on at all times. Every time I went out there, I didn't know what the situation was going to be. I didn't know who was going to be out there, how many people. You had to go with the flow, with whatever was going on. You had to fit in. I don't know anything about guns. <laughs> what do you call these? Well, these are 38s. You got four inch here, snub nose here. They're standard police issue. Also 12 gauge, sawed off shotgun. That's what the police get when they come in. Three weeks into the operation, Jimmy unexpectedly volunteered to take Pat to his drug lab. He was finally going to show her how he made the drugs. Where's she going? The police thought the lab was close by. They did not expect Jimmy to leave the farm. Where are we? Short way from the lab, Darla. A half hour later, they arrived at Jimmy's secret lab. All right, give us the wire. What? We want the wire. I don't know what you're talking about. I was so scared, I couldn't think of anything. It just, um... He just caught me off guard. And I figured because I knew I had it on, they did too. And I thought, well, this is it, you know. Yeah, don't you have a TV? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. He says, you know, he said, you watch TV. And when people do this, please bug them. Have a wire before they make a big bust. And he turned around and he told the guy, he said, she don't get it. <laughs> I don't think she gets it, Jim. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> So anyway, we went in the shed, and they showed me the, the lab, and they explained to me how it worked. Yes. How do you work this? Well, this is our boiler. That's raw liquid speed. We take the ephedrine, the red phosphorus, some acid, boil it up. And they're so explaining it, how it goes separate. from one jar into separate. the other one and goes through the tube. The and I still don't understand it. So I just act like... I could, actually, I didn't want to remember, if you want to know the truth. I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to leave. I wanted to go back where my car was. 
So I told Jim, I said, well, I've got to go. I wasn't feeling real well. I said, I've got to go. I said, I want to go back to my car. Well, I had some chemicals in the trunk of my car that the police had given me to deliver to him. How much do you want for this stuff? What do you think it's worth? Yeah. You tell me. Wait, do you want to More trouble. Pieces of Pat's conversation were being picked up by one of Jimmy's men listening to an old police scanner. 3,000. 3,000? Hey, Jim. What? I was listening to a police scanner, and I heard a woman's voice. At that point, I knew that was it. I figured that was I'd had it. My time was up. All right, talk to you about it later. Jim's completely ignored him. I, I don't know. I can't explain why. Got a deal. Once again, Pat had dodged a bullet. The police realized they could no longer risk sending Pat to meet with the gang. Three days later, they decided to make the bust. Saying she had more chemicals to sell, Pat set up a meeting just before dawn at a local park. Did you bring the stuff? Of course. OK. Follow me. It was time for the exchange. When Pat said the words, go to Reno, the police would yeah, move in. Here. Two thousand? Okay. I guess I'm just gonna forget everything and go to Reno. daybreak, the rest of the gang was arrested. The entire drug-making operation was closed down. The drug dealer, Jimmy, was convicted of possession and conspiracy to manufacture methamphetamine and served two years for his crimes. Happily, Pat's daughters are no longer addicted to drugs. Not only did Pat save the family she loves, she performed an outstanding service and set quite an example for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Pat Morrison. Someone once said, it's not just life that matters, it's the courage you bring to it. And that certainly is true of the people we've seen tonight. And if you should find yourself struggling against the odds, we wish you courage and the very best. See you next week. Good night. On the next Against All Odds, these true stories. A skydiving instructor and a first-time student jump out of a plane. Seconds later, disaster. The instructor is unconscious and they're spinning wildly out of control. Also, an expedition a mile beneath the surface of the earth into a world of total darkness. Explorers follow a treacherous, uncharted river into the deep unknown. And a harrowing midnight crash. Can an innocent children's bedtime story actually help a little boy save his mother? against all odds. contains recreations of actual events. Tonight, these true stories. 
A woman passenger in a small plane faces certain death when her pilot has a heart attack and dies. A young woman desperately needs a kidney transplant. Only her father can help, but she hasn't seen him for 30 years. A little girl wanders onto the railroad tracks in the path of a train that cannot stop in time, but somehow the trainman must save her. Against all odds. Ladies and gentlemen, Lindsay Wagner and Everett McGill. Hello and welcome. You know, if we could look into the future, we'd be amazed by the predicaments and the surprises that are in store for us. Maybe even scared by them. In the stories you see tonight, we'll meet several people who never expected what they'd be up against, but had to find the grit and the determination to beat the odds. For instance, what if you were the lone passenger in a private airplane when something went terribly wrong? Here's how one woman reacted to a sudden tragedy 3,000 feet above the ground. Oh, are you excited? Yeah, I am. I'm looking forward to it. I tell you, we couldn't ask for better weather today. For New Jersey housewife Barbara oh, Basile, yeah. August 21st, 1988 oh, promised to be a relaxing oh, day. Her brother-in-law Gordon had invited her for a scenic airplane ride with his cousin, amateur pilot Bob Bunyan. Great. Volunteer? Bob owned a single-engine airplane and suggested it would be a more enjoyable ride, one passenger at a time. Barbara volunteered to go first. I got into the plane, and I waved to Gordon, and he was waving back, and I thought it was like my last wave to him, and I actually had gotten tears in my eyes. I felt I was never going to see him again. But I had a feeling then, I don't know what it was, but it was like a forewarning. I don't know, but I knew something was going to happen. At approximately 1.30 in the afternoon, the plane took off from the Marlboro, New Jersey airport. Oh, it's just beautiful. It was just a gorgeous day. And then we started to fly over the ocean. I was looking out the side window of the airplane, and I felt somebody slumped over on my shoulder. Barbara had no idea the pilot had just suffered a massive heart attack. His eyes were rolled back and had a very, very hard time breathing. First thing I was is, let's get this man breathing so he could land the plane for me. But when I gave him the mouth to mouth, he went so fast. And then I felt his carotid artery and his pulse. And I put my head up against his ch uh, chest. I, I heard nothing. He was just gone. I, I knew it. I knew he was gone. Then I got just complete panic, and I just, I was screaming. How could this happen to me? The final reaction is, I'm going to die. That's the final realization I came to. I was not going to survive this. Barbara tried to contact the control tower. She was hoping they'd be able to talk her down as she'd seen in a movie. Somebody, help me. Hello. But she couldn't get the radio to work. Panic set in. The dashboard was a blur. Barbara needed her glasses. They were in her purse, buried beneath the back seat. With no alternative, Barbara realized she had to become an instant pilot. I was trying to teach myself how to fly. And then those little pedals on the floor, which now I know they're called rudders. I, I hit the right one, and it banked a little to the right, and it banked a little to the left. So I calmed down at this point where I could rationalize a little. After 20 minutes of trial and error, Barbara figured out how to steer the plane, but she had absolutely no idea how to land it. I didn't know how to read the fuel gauges. How about if I were to run out of fuel over townhouses or condominiums and kill people? See, that, 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 that was the biggest thing. I didn't want to, I knew I was going to die, but I didn't want to hurt anyone. I didn't want to hurt anyone. Barbara remained in the air circling for an hour and a half. 
She resigned herself to the fact that she was going to die. But how could she avoid killing anyone else? And I thought, what am I going to do? About two seconds later, this ray of light came from the side window. And I said, gotcha. I just reached over and turned off the ignition. and I came really crashing down and I really went off the seat again and I stayed there because I couldn't get up on the seat. I felt I had broken legs. I, I couldn't get up. Barbara's plane hit a field, bounced, and then flipped into some trees. A passing driver saw the crash and raced over to help. Miraculously, Barbara was alive. I remember when he said, put your arms around me, put your arms around my neck. And I, I sort of squeezed him, I said, are you an angel or are you human? I remember saying that. I couldn't believe it. If I knew then I was alive. Barbara suffered four pelvic fractures, severe burns caused by leaking fuel and numerous cuts and bruises. But she did recover and was released from the hospital two and a half weeks later. An investigation by the FAA resulted in some astonishing revelations. If Barbara had not turned off the flow of gas, there might have been a fire on impact. As the plane skimmed the top of the trees, its speed was significantly reduced. And fortunately, the field where she crashed had been freshly plowed, creating a unique natural cushion. No matter how bad a situation is, there's always... Give it that chance. Don't just throw up your hands and say, well, this is the end. Give it a chance. You have nothing to lose. An incredible story, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome a very, very brave woman, Barbara Basile. In a moment, a woman who is critically ill gets a surprise visit that could save her life. He said, sweetheart, he says, I want you to have my kidney. He says, I want you to have it right now. Sadly, it's all too common these days for a family to break up and completely lose touch with one another. Next, we have a dramatic story of how a life and death emergency brought one family back together. June 1990. Jackie Fish, age 32, is found at home by her mother in terrible pain and is rushed to the emergency room. Her blood pressure is soaring out of control, leaving her in imminent danger of stroke even death. After a lifetime battling kidney disease, Jackie Fish was losing her fight. Soon her doctors decided it was time to take the inevitable next step. When they told me that they were going to remove both my kidneys, I had a really hard time dealing with that. I just... Giving up something that's a part of your body is very hard to do. Once her kidneys were removed, Jackie's life became completely dependent on kidney dialysis. These lengthy treatments three times a week were the only way to cleanse the impurities from her blood. What she desperately needed was a kidney transplant. But when her mother and sister were tested as donors, neither had the right tissue to match. There was no alternative but to simply continue the treatments and wait. The only thoughts that we had is that Jackie would have to be on a donor's list. That Jackie would just simply have to mark the time, hoping and praying that she would soon be able to get the right tissue type. It never occurred to Jackie to consider her father. There had been almost no communication since he had left 30 years earlier. Her only memory of the man was of his one visit to her in the hospital when she was a very sick eight-year-old girl. 
Since that day, there had been no letters, no phone calls. He simply faded from her life. What bothered me the most is um, I would go over to my friend's house, and I would see their father and the mother together, and I would just, like, kind of miss that a little bit. I guess I always wanted to be, like, daddy's little girl or something. Now Jackie faced the greatest challenge of her life. Finding a kidney that matched her tissue type could easily take years. Then, one day last fall... Hello? Hello. May I speak to Jackie? I, um, kept in yes. touch with my parents, and they did tell me that Jackie had been sick, but I never, never realized how serious it was. Jackie, this is your father, John Fish. Oh my I really God. wanted to be the donor and try to make up for it of not being there during those years, when I perhaps should have been there, and I wasn't. And he said, sweetheart, he says, I want you to have my kidney. He says, I want you to have it right now. And I thought that was great. He's like, my bags are packed. He goes, I'm ready to fly into Philadelphia to give you my kidney. Oh, it was unreal knowing that I was going to the airport to meet my father after 22 years. I didn't know what to expect. So this one gentleman walked by with grayish hair, and I turned to my mother. I was like, is that my dad? And she's like, no, I don't think so. And at one point, Jackie and I looked at one another and bust out crying. We said, here, we two are standing here waiting for one of the most important people of your whole life someone who is going to give you a new lease on life, and we're not too sure what he looks like. It's been so long. Finally, we saw this tall gentleman come walking down. Jackie, there, there's your dad. And as soon as I saw him, I just busted up in the tears because I couldn't believe it that this man came through when I needed it the most. You know, it was great. Jackie and her father immediately checked into a New Jersey hospital for a barrage of tests. It was confirmed that John Fish would make a suitable kidney donor for his ailing daughter. One week later, the operation began. A kidney transplant is a complex procedure, and success is by no means guaranteed. John, of course, is a middle-aged man. And Jackie had had a bout with high blood pressure. So it, it was a scary time as well. During six hours of surgery, the organ was removed from John. Then Jackie was anesthetized. And the kidney of a 60-year-old father was implanted in his 32-year-old daughter. We were concerned. We really, really were. The doctors reassured us that John was doing well. And the minute that the doctor told me how well Jackie was doing, I was thrilled. I was relieved. Two days later, Jackie pulled herself from her bed feeling better than she had in years. The new kidney was working beautifully. I felt alive. I felt like a new person. And the first thing I had to see my father. I shuffled myself into his room. Dad? As soon as he saw my face, he was beaming. And I was like, Dad, you gave me such a beautiful gift. I said, I feel so good. And I did. I felt great. Happy I could help. So I just threw my arms around him. I hugged him and I kissed him. And I told him, I said, Dad, thank you for being here for me. You came through when I really needed you. And he just said, sweetheart, he goes, this is what I wanted to do. Love is a powerful cure. It's been one year since the surgery, and Jackie is still feeling great. And equally important is the new relationship she shares with her father. They've stayed in very close touch ever since the operation. The moment of story I don't think you'll ever forget. The child wanders into the path of an oncoming freight train. 
in only seconds to prevent a tragedy. to meet a man who risked his life to save a stranger's child, a man who knew only too well how painful that loss could be. It was a quiet afternoon in 1985. Jeannie Defaba was playing with her friends outside her home in Crescent, Pennsylvania. No one seemed to notice when the little girl, not yet two years old, broke away from the group and began to wander off on her own. Moments later, she'd crossed the street and made her way up onto the train tracks nearby. Unaware of the 62-car freight train rolling straight towards her just a quarter of a mile away. John Cole and Edward Todd were operating the locomotive. At first, it looked like a small animal was out on the tracks. No, it's a child! Cole instantly pulled the emergency brake, but it would not stop the train in time. Jeannie was less than 500 feet away. I went out on the platform. My conductor, Eddie Todd, he'd come out behind me, and we're screaming at her to get off the rail because we're still moving at least 25 miles an hour. I'm yelling to her, honey, move to the side, move to the side, making a hand motion to the side. But I couldn't get any eye contact with her. I couldn't get her to understand. At the speed they were traveling, it would have been impossible to jump off and run to her in time. Jeannie couldn't hear their warnings. And as the two men watched in horror, the little girl simply sat down on the tracks. Six months prior to this, I lost my boy, Chris. Uh, on a farm accident. With the memory of the death of his own son so fresh in his mind, Cole would do almost anything to save this child's life. I was screaming to her to get off the rail, and uh, I decided that she wasn't going to leave it, so then I walked my way down the steps of the engine and uh, swung myself over in front of it to uh, get her off. One little slip. You know, I lost my balance, I'd fall backwards, and now I've been right in line with the wheels. He would have only one chance to reach out and try to push the little girl out of the way of the speeding train. I'm stretched out as far as I can reach, and that's when I give her a, a hard hit to uh, knock her off the rail. I remember looking back at her and hollering, stay down. You know, stay down until the train came to a stop. I watched from the platform there, and I couldn't tell whether she was, whether she had landed completely clear of the rail or not. As the train slowed down, Cole jumped off, ran back down the tracks, and found the frightened child. When I ran back to her, I picked her up, and I squeezed her real tight, you know, and say, it's all right, you know. Everything's okay, you know. And I try to comf comfort her as much as I could. Minutes later, John Cole carried her back home, and little Jeannie Defabaugh was returned safe and sound to the arms of her worried, thankful mother. Lady, is this your child? Yes, this is. Well, I handed the child to her, and I proceeded to tell her the grief that I had saved her by doing what I did. Kind of, I just had lost my child. It just uh, rewards you so much, you know what I mean, as far as doing what you can to save somebody else and, and uh, saving the parents from the, all the grief that we went through.
For his act of courage, John Cole was honored by the Carnegie Foundation. He received a medal and a cash award, which he used to start an education fund for Jeannie Defabaugh. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Cole. When we come back, we will see how lives have been saved by the most unlikely everyday lives. I've got a question for you. Take an ordinary pocket calculator and two large pizzas, holding anchovies. Now, what do these objects have in common? Oddly, both have saved a life. When 24-year-old Cole Wolner was dropping off a pizza at a house on Detroit's northwest side, he had no idea he was being set up for a robbery. Instinctively, Cole held up the pieces for protection. To his amazement, he discovered that they had deflected the gun blast, leaving one large pizza with extra everything, including enough buckshot to take a man's life. A year later, another surprising close call. 40-year-old Kenneth McCarroll was making deliveries in an ice cream truck. As he entered the freezer, he put on a jacket to protect him from the cold. In his lower left-hand pocket was a gift from his wife, his trusty $10 calculator. When I picked up the first item I was gonna sell, I felt the truck move and turned around and there was a man in the door of the truck and he shot me. When I heard the gun go off, I felt on impact and I clutched my stomach and held it. After a while, I found my calculator and I seen that it had a hole in it. And I started looking at, you know, looking at it and seeing how bad it was mangled and I just couldn't believe that it was my calculator that stopped a bullet. Kenneth was saved by the narrowest of margins. Cole and Kenneth are just two people who owe their lives to everyday objects. Listen to this. A 29-year-old plumber was saved when his seat belt deflected a gunshot. Then there was a man whose beeper caught a bullet as he was defending his girlfriend from a robber. And finally, the man who's alive today because he stopped a bullet with his false teeth. And yes, he was wearing them at the time. He was. Good night. On the next Against All Odds, these two stories. A runaway train with deadly explosive gas on board rolls backwards down the tracks. It's a railroad nightmare and a race against time. An American fleeing Kuwait during the war with Iraq is taken hostage. Only a young girl can save him. And a man grabs a ride in a taxi and discovers that it's his very own stolen car. But can he prove it? The following program contains recreations of actual events. Tonight, these true stories. A railroad nightmare.
A runaway train with deadly explosive gas rolls backwards down the tracks. It's a race against time to stop it. An American flees Kuwait, Iraqi troops searching for him. At the border, he's taken hostage. Only a young girl can save him. A man ends up hitching a ride in what turns out to be his very own stolen car. But can he prove it? Against all odds. Ladies and gentlemen, Lindsay Wagner and Edward McGill. Good evening and welcome to the show. Tonight you're about to see a truly remarkable display of courage, confidence, and coincidence. You'll meet several people who demonstrate that beating the odds, no matter how great, often requires a timely combination of all three. Without a doubt, one of the worst fears of anyone who works the railroad is the nightmare of a runaway train. When it happens, as you'll see, it's a race against time to ward off catastrophe. It was the longest train anyone could remember leaving Stockton, California. 140 cars, nearly two miles long. After riding 10 straight hours, the four-man crew stopped for coffee near a little town of Escalon, leaving the train and its deadly cargo, 1,200 tons of LPG, liquid petroleum gas, alone on the tracks. seven minutes and then we walked out and I was the first one to come out and then all of a sudden my fireman comes running by me and I said hey, where are you going he where said are you going? the train is rolling out of town and it looked to me like the headlight was a little further back than I remembered walking but I thought well with 140 cars, I figured that some of the cars had just rolled out from the slack action, and uh, it did roll back a little ways, and he'd catch it, no problem. So I'm just kind of walking faster and chewing on my tuna sandwich and downing my milk. I mean, I'm hungry. That's the main thing on my mind at this point. So I'm sort of jogging, thinking there'd be no problem here. After about three quarters to a mile, I saw my fireman laying in the ballast. He'd given all that he could, and he had collapsed against the rail. Okay, gotta stop the train. train. And all he said to me was, catch the train. And then I realized, you know, this is a serious emergency we have here. Liquid petroleum gas is extremely flammable. An accident could easily set off a deadly explosion and fire. After running about a quarter of a mile, I realized that the headlight was getting further away from me. And I'm thinking to myself, this train is going way too fast. I can't run another inch. But I know from having remembered on the radio, there's a train sitting on the main line at Stockton. We have explosives and LPG gas, and we have a situation that could be a potential catastrophe. If I don't catch this train at this point, uh, there's a bad situation waiting to develop down the road. Exhausted, Terry realized he could never catch the train on foot. When he saw the lights of a farmhouse nearby, he decided to get help. Hello? Hello? I need some help. Anybody in there? At one in the morning, Denise Powell awoke to find a desperate stranger pounding on her door. Train on the main line. Uh, I'm a locomotive engineer. Have a she naturally doesn't trust me at, at, at all. Up. She's not opening the door. Do you guys have an idea? I don't have any idea. I'm not at this joking. point, I don't have any identification with me. And I still can't convince her that this is a real I emergency. Have any numbers. Uh, call the railroad. Call railroad emergency. 
emergency services. Just then, Denise's husband, Keith, shouted for Terry to hop in his truck. Keith had suspected trouble when he noticed the train rolling by. When he heard Terry pounding at the door, he put two and two together, got dressed, and put his truck in gear. The runaway train had already rolled another mile down the track. Stockton and impending disaster was now only 13 miles away. The two men raced alongside, trying to catch up and overtake the train. Ten minutes later, they came to a railroad crossing. Terry feared this would be his last chance to stop the train. It's just clicking by like this. I'm so exhausted, I can't even get the door open. My arms feel like they're just made out of rubber. I, I literally can't lift them to open the door. He has to reach across me to open the door. He throws open the door and says, catch that train. So I go up to the road crossing. I know I've only got 30 or 40 feet of pavement to run across because after, on either side of that is nothing but rocks and mud where I've got no footing. So when the engines are getting closer to me as they're rolling my direction, I start running. If at that moment I had lost my grip, I would have been cut in half. I've got to pull myself up on this top step or I'm going to either go under this engine or I'm going to fall off. And there's no chance that anybody else can catch this thing. and pulled the emergency brake. The chase was over. Terry had stopped the runaway train. It was a miracle to me that I ever made it that far, and it was just a great relief to me that I was able to bring the thing to a stop. We're secure. Terry notified his dispatcher that the emergency was under control, and by dawn, the train made its way safely to Fresno. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man who finally caught the train and his breath, Terry Easley. moment, we'll be back with the story of an American who refused to be taken hostage during the war in Kuwait. They saved my life. You know. I wouldn't be here today, probably, if it hadn't been for them. August 2nd, 1990, 100,000 heavily armed Iraqi troops storm into Kuwait. In less than a day, the tiny nation of two million is captured. Many are brutally slaughtered. In the next 72 hours, hundreds of thousands attempt to flee to the Saudi Arabian border. At the heavily armed checkpoints, most are turned back. Reports quickly spread that Saddam Hussein's secret police are rounding up foreigners, holding them hostage, and hanging anyone who helps them. This was the predicament that confronted a soft-spoken 46-year-old American. Richard Clay, an electrical engineer from Indiana, had spent four years in Kuwait working for an oil company, supervising a staff of 500 employees. After the war erupted, Richard was told that Iraqi guards had already been to his office searching for him. Fearing for his life, he went into hiding. An innocent man caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. For three weeks, Richard hid in several apartments in Kuwait City. His only link to the outside world was a group of workers from the Philippines concerned about his safety. They brought him food and news of the widespread devastation. 
Desperate to avoid being taken hostage, Richard decided to escape. I know a lot about the uh, hostage situation that uh, went on in Lebanon, and uh, to me it was worth risking my life rather than being uh, taken hostage because I understand, you know, what happens to hostages. The Filipinos told him that they were free to leave Kuwait using transit documents they'd obtained from their embassy. I'd seen one of these uh, Filipino travel documents. You know, I said, uh, you know, get me one of these, you know, see if you can buy one, steal one, or whatever. They couldn't get one, but uh, they brought back some blanks. For 10 days working with crude equipment, Richard's friends carved out an official stamp from a rubber shower sandal. Time and again, they failed to duplicate the embassy ink until they discovered that by adding milk, they had a perfect match. The documents were complete. Richard Clay, Hoosier from Bloomington, became Ricardo Arazzo Clay from Batanga City, the Philippines. A couple of the Filipinos were with me. They said that uh, they knew where there were uh, five or six buses, so I told them to go steal one. August 28th, Richard and 36 of his co-workers climbed aboard a stolen bus and began their escape. The border to Saudi Arabia was too dangerous. Their only route was across Iraq, right through Baghdad, and onto the neutral zone between Iraq and Jordan. Getting out of uh, Kuwait, of course, we've seen burnout tanks, burnout automobiles on the side of the road, but the roads were just filled with Iraqis. At the first checkpoint, soldiers demanded all the Filipinos' transit documents. Mixed with the others, Richard's forged papers deceived the Iraqi border guards. August 31st, three days later, after 900 miles and 100 degree heat, Richard reached the Iraqi border to Jordan. Unlike previous checkpoints, at this one, an Iraqi guard boarded the bus. Everybody hold the documents in the air. When he arrived to me, he took the travel document away. He looked at the travel document, looked at me. Come with me. What's the problem? Get off the bus now! I said, uh, you know, I'm trying to go to right, Jordan. All I want to do is go home. He said, get off the bus. And he just you know, took me by the arm, you know, and took me into the uh, border shack, which was a little porta camp. Told me to go in the back room where they threw all their garbage. He pushed me down on, onto my knees and told me to put my hands behind my head. I did that. An American? No, sir, I'm not. I'm not a Marine. No, I'm not a Marine. He said, you know, Americans, uh, we can kill American. Americans uh, for trying to escape. He says, if I kill you, he said, uh, nobody would even know it. I says, well, I'm not American. I said, I'm Filipino. I says, if uh, you want to kill me, I says, you can do that, but send my body back to uh, the Philippine Embassy because I don't want to be buried in your country. Don't be a giant! Outside, Richard's friends boldly fought for his release. The Filipinos spread their luggage across the road. They blocked all traffic. They would not leave without their friend. Four hours passed. A Filipino girl named Libby entered the hut to beg for Richard's release. She claimed that he was her uncle. He supports the whole family. We'll just ask him a few questions. Please let him. She was a very good-looking little girl. Family. He kind of shined up to her, and you know, he became very attached to her. Another forty minutes went by, and Libby was able to persuade the guard to let her bring Richard some food, and with it, a note. The Iraqis they had a machine gun right at the uh, guard uh, post there. And uh, a lot of the Filipinos were milling around this uh, uh, machine gun emplacement. 
And I read this note, and they said if I wasn't out of there, you know, within the next hour, that uh, they were going to take that machine gun and get me out of there. You know, I ate the note, you know, with the food, and I told Libby, or uh, you know, nodded at her and told her, you know, not to do that. Well, he was uh, romancing Libby there for about an hour. He really wasn't paying much attention to me, but he was having fun trying to get you know, some kind of address or something, like he was going to be able to see her sometime, maybe in the Philippines or something. Richard was interrogated by three other guards. Then he was left alone. The Filipinos refused to leave the checkpoint. Libby continued to plead for Richard's release. The situation had reached a stalemate. About an hour later, the border guard took me out of the port camp, came over and he gave uh, Libby my uh, travel document and smiled kind of uh, sarcastically. Goodbye, Maureen. Goodbye. After six hours of interrogation, Richard and his companions crossed into the neutral zone and freedom. Well, the Filipinos have helped me escape. Uh, you know, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for them. You know, I mean, they saved my life. You know. I wouldn't be here today, probably, if it hadn't been for them. Immediately following his ordeal, Richard could have returned to his home in Indiana. Instead, he remained in Jordan long enough to help 60 of his friends and fellow workers escape. Coming up now, a totally different kind of story. Imagine hailing a ride in a taxi, only to discover it is your own stolen car. to discover your car has been stolen? Well, sadly, the odds are you'll never see it again. But here's a man who not only saw his car again, he actually hitched a ride in it. 27-year-old security guard Bogdan Satella was taking the bus home from his chess club last fall, his car having been stolen two weeks earlier, when suddenly... There goes my car. Out of the clear blue, it's my car. And I'm in shock. Bogdan hailed another cab and took off in pursuit. Follow that cab. In spite of the taxi decals and a new sign on the roof, Bogdan felt certain he was following his stolen car. After a few blocks, it pulled over to the curb. Quickly, he ran up and stepped inside. It looked like a taxi, but he was convinced it was his car. Downtown. I looked at the glove compartment, and that seemed to be like my car. I played with the windows, and I noticed the sunroof down. And I said to myself, this has to be my car. How you doing? Finally, as they passed a policeman on the sidewalk, Satella knew it was time to act. What is it? What is wrong with you? Hey! Give me back my keys, man. I'll tell you, what's going what? on? The guy stole my car, sir. What is wrong with you, man? He stole your taxi. Yeah, here's the registration. And the cop looks at me strange. You know, he's he's like, well, well, what are you talking about, buddy? How do you know it's your car? This is my car, officer. You made a stolen vehicle? He checked the vehicle car identification number, and that didn't match the owner registration card that I showed. It appears to be his car. Sir, I told him, I was thinking, hey, uh, the, uh, the vehicle car identification number has been changed. Then I, I thought to myself, I have to convince him that this is definitely my car. And I said, oh, officer, officer, how about if we pop the trunk open, you know, because uh, I, I had some chess sets in there, you, you know, and, and some other things. Why don't you just pop the trunk open, you know, perhaps just see if something's there. It was a long shot, but it was Satella's last chance to prove it was, in fact, his car. The policeman popped open the trunk, and lo and behold, Checkmate. Satella got his car back, and the cab driver was booked for Grand Theft Auto.
Do you think you could survive a 1,400-mile trip with little or no oxygen at 40 degrees below zero? Well, let me tell you about an accidental tourist who faced just those odds. Meet Bobby, who for all of his two years had lived in the tiny town of New Caney, Texas. One day last winter, Bobby decided it was time to see the world. Bobby hit the road, wandering 30 miles, all the way from New Caney to the Houston Intercontinental Airport. For Bobby, it was a chance to hitch a ride to New York, so he climbed right into the wheel well of a Boeing 727, about to take off for the Big Apple. Not a wise choice. At 31,000 feet, there is almost no oxygen inside the wheel well, and the temperature drops to 40 degrees below zero. Bobby was likely to use up all of his nine lives. After a bone-chilling three hours, Bobby and the plane touched down at Kennedy International Airport. And the maintenance crew made a surprising discovery. Hickman, come here! Look at that. I looked up and I thought I saw a very large dead raccoon. And I, ooh. <laughs> so I used a uh, butt end of a flashlight and I gently prodded it to see what was, what was in there. Bobby was freezing cold, near death but incredibly hanging on to life. Here's the oxygen. A crewman grabbed an emergency oxygen bottle, cut the mask down to size, and gave Bobby pure oxygen to try and bring him around. It's taking it. It's gonna be all right, kitty. After 20 minutes, it looked like Bobby was going to pull through. You're gonna make it, Hickman. Yeah. It was like sheer and utter amazement. I really didn't think he'd make the grade. And it just, it's just totally amazing that he did. Bobby's owner was located by the tag on his collar, and in a few hours, he was on the next flight back to Houston. This time, he was invited up into the cockpit, where he was treated to a first-class meal. And on the menu that night, poached salmon. We'll be right back. Unexpected events can have a profound impact on the way we live our lives. How we choose to respond in the face of adversity tells a lot about who we are. Tonight we've seen how a few ordinary people have succeeded in conquering overwhelming odds. Their unique accomplishments are an inspiration to all of us. Good night. Good night. Have you or someone you know beaten the odds in an unusual way? We'd like to hear from you. If you have a story or know someone who has beaten the odds, send us a description of who was involved, what happened, where it happened, and when it happened. Make sure to include your name, address, and phone number. Mail your story to Against All Odds, Post Office Box 10729, Burbank, California, 91510. That's Against All Odds, Post Office Box 10729, Burbank, California, 91510.